I don't tell teams if it should be pink or blue. That's horrible. Uh, it's not my job. That's my opinion. Everyone here has an opinion, and they're all valid. But they're also extremely destructive to a production cycle. It's important that we, we find ways as execs at, uh, at Ubisoft to work with our teams and to serve the brands we build. And more importantly, to serve the worlds we, we build together. Uh, we build systems that fuel our worlds. We build gameplays to underline our systems. We populate our worlds with characters and stories. Now, we've realized that it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, it's not that simple to build a world. I, when my dad, my dad knows nothing about video games and, and creative content, so when I try to tell him what my job is, uh, I build worlds, he's like, huh? <laughs> and I, I often tell him, well, it's like making things accessible, dad. If I build a world that's cool, maybe you can be a tourist in it. Maybe you can understand the codes of that world. So in light of this, we work very hard with our teams to build worlds. I am now going to showcase a video that we share with our teams to kind of give you a small insight into our creative process in world building. This is a video called World Logic. Please, can you showcase the first video? Thank you. Every event is the result of a network of elements coexisting in a coherent world. <laughs> An arrow shot from the bow of a Native American hunter is the result of the hostility between cowboys and Indians, an act of aggression caused when a cowboy stands too close to a herd of buffaloes. The fort isn't here by coincidence. It was built to control a conquered portion of Indian territory. It was established close to a forest for food and wood, near a gold mine to protect pioneers gathering viable resources. It's also a strategic spot between two rivers to ensure trade and travel. The nearby cliff limits the possibility of an incoming attack. Now that the region is safe, a village begins to grow around the fort. When the city becomes profitable, a railway is built to transport people and resources back and forth, and ultimately to turn the outpost into a starting point for further conquest. The train station will benefit from the fort's protection against the natives. Being pushed away by the flourishing city, the native village has now moved closer to this new herd, and it stands in the way of the advancing railway. The conflict isn't going to end anytime soon. With the city growing, new layers enrich this ecosystem. The state of the world is the logical consequence of the history we've just built for it. And as the player moves on to another region, it will inevitably impact and enrich the entire ecosystem of the game. Logic isn't the only important factor for imagining a world. We must also make sure it is consistent. Building lore for an open world game means identifying the three or four underlying ideas that form the basis, the pillars of the game. For instance, if in your game you play as a Native American hunter in a Western frontier context, the pillars might be war, Native American culture, and hunter fantasy. Correctly identifying and researching the pillars is of the utmost importance. Every aspect of the game must respond to these pillars, as well as the themes and logic they imply. For example, racial antagonism implies situations which deal with humiliation. Opposing beliefs could relate to religion, and genocide refers to explicit violence and cruelty. If one of these themes isn't well thought through due to misconceptions or self-censorship, the whole structure of the game becomes fragile. If, because of self-censorship, you decide not to include Native Americans because that period of history is too controversial, the whole game starts losing consistency and interest. Changing that pillar to something else might look like a good solution in the short term, but in the end it will affect the other pillars and the consistency of the entire game. Changing a pillar means changing the whole concept of the game. It's the same with external input that does not fit with the consistency of your world, previous iterations of an IP, demands from departments, or market assumptions. If you modify your pillars for the wrong reasons during production, the logic of your world will implode. But let's get back to our Western, and let's acknowledge the dark side of American history. Now all the aspects of this context will influence everything you'll be able to develop for the game. Missions, events, characters, side quests, tone, and so on. Time spent doing thorough research is hugely important because it's a first step towards creative understanding. So embrace that first step candidly without putting preconceived ideas in it. Following all these guidelines implies a very strict design process which takes time, effort, and expects you to think candidly. But they are the essential factors for providing a healthy environment that will allow your game world to grow. We must make meaningful choices and embrace the logical consequences of these choices. That's how world logic is created. So, one would think it's easy uh, to do this. We, we, we walk the streets every day um, here in Barcelona with you guys. I think maybe I know Barcelona. Um, I've read many books about it. Uh, I've watched many movies about it. I've been on Wiki. Uh, it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's actually, it's someone else's, uh, when you read a book or a movie, as good as it is, 
it's a wonderful entrance point, but it's another creator's uh, digestion of his creative process. So if you only use this, you become the diluted version of someone else's work, or you become the diluted of the diluted of the di diluted. And that gets iffy. That's when you get a pale copy fantasy book of Lord of the Rings, for example, because the myth, the lore, the meaning, Tolkien being a linguist, is forgotten along that process. So at UB, we, we call this a trap. Uh, and one of the things that we've changed in our creative process is not only do we want you to fully understand the systems, the anthropology, the politics, uh, the social classes, the flavors, the colors of a place, but we want you to experience it. You're not allowed uh, to start a game. We spend a lot of money uh, on building these worlds. You go smell the grass. I mean, I have sometimes spent months researching something. It, stepping out, even of an airport, as, as blah as they are, stepping out of an airport, seeing cars, people's faces, the smell, the rhythm, you can't get that from Wiki. You, you just can't. We had been working on Far Cry 4 for over a year. Uh, it's set in the uh, imaginary world of Karat, but it is obviously uh, inspired by Nepal. Uh, we decided to send a team uh, out to Nepal. I'll, uh, I'll show you uh, a short video and I'll tell you what it changed for us in, a production, uh, in our production. So on day two of the trip, uh, the few guys we sent there were calling uh, the, uh, the producer and, uh, and other, other positions on the team saying, we fucked up Nepal. <laughs> it looks nothing like we did. The proportions aren't right. The architecture isn't right. The rhythm of the game is off. The tone of the game is off. And, and trust me, they spent a lot of time researching it. We had thousands of pictures. We had thousands of experts come in and and tell us our, our, their stories, and that's all fine. We need it. I'm not saying don't do this. I'm just saying we need to take it to the next level. Now, although we sent a few people out there, we are still faced with the challenge that creating worlds takes hundreds of people, humongous groups. We unfortunately can't send everyone um, on location. So at UB, we have decided to create a, uh, a tool a lot of what I do is create tools to help creative mature uh, their vision. So we created something called the World Texture Facility Tool. I'll, uh, I'm all for videos, so video number three, please. The life of a developer is a tough one. You play all night long while being abusively charged for being a lazy partner. But the toughest thing is to be efficient in the morning when the world you have to build is an entire digital NYC with hundreds of people, stories, cultures, historical facts, and so on. Lucky you, an incredible tool exists to help your daily work, enhance your team's knowledge, and simplify your already very complex life. Just connect to the WTF, browse the world map, and choose the location your game is set in. This world texture facility is indeed an easy access to everything you wanted to know but were afraid to ask. <laughs> Filled with hundreds of posts, pictures, videos, interviews, and links to in-depth researches. Need to know where bums gather to drink in Manhattan? Or how many kilos of cocaine yuppies put in their nose during the 80s? No problem. The WTF has the answers. Depending on the amount of beer you drank last night, you can choose to be led by the tool and randomly discover the subjects of the daily inspiration. Or you can proactively dive into the countless categories to find highly specific info. The ass lickers can even choose the must-see banner. 
a compilation of the core team's favorite topics. Thanks to the WTF, everyone can easily share, comment, and highlight information without waiting days for a meeting with no room available. No more folders, thousands of pages, tons of books piled up on desks. No more never-ending speeches. An image is worth a thousand words. The WTF is a unique Ubisoft tool designed to be an encyclopedia of genuine, unexpected, and homemade info you would never find elsewhere. The only thing you need to do is get curious. The WTF will do the rest. Have a nice, enriching day. What kind of fucked up tour is this? So, the WTF has become quite famous at uh, Ubisoft. Um, the tool's important, but more importantly, it's the, uh, the process we put into it. It's not a wiki. I have no interest in recreating something that already exists. We work for months. Uh, the, I like good fixing. It's finding the right people on location, locals. It's like visiting a city with someone you know. It always beats the experience you would have as a tourist. Uh, we go beyond. Um, we, when we did work for the division, uh, Tom Clancy's the division, we went under Central Park. We found out that one of the reasons there are less homeless people in Manhattan is that they live underground. Um, it's, it, it's just amazing. We come back with upwards of 100,000 pictures, hundreds of hours of videos, we record sounds, and I want to make sure that it's the invisible part of the iceberg. If I see anything wiki on the WTF, I ax it out. I want something edgy. We need to fuel our worlds with new ideas. We are privileged in the sense that we get to share our love with, uh, with gamers, so let's try to enrich them, with them, uh, enrich them a bit. Uh, I'll show you another video quickly and give you a couple anecdotes about it. This is work we did for Assassin's Creed Unity. Can I have uh, video number four, I think, please? So, there are a million books on the French Revolution. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, and cool researchers. What I mean by taking it one step further is we worked with Agnès Bézier, who's a famous French costume designer. She took us to the Museum of Fashion. The guys got to hold 18th century fashion magazines. They got to touch textile. We took pictures. We worked with François Prédron, an expert in the French Revolution. The extra bonus for this is that if you get along with your contacts, they're actually a content opportunity for your game as well. So Francois wrote 1,001 stories that's just in the WTF database, and the game designers use the real stories as context for side quests to give it more impact with the French Revolution. We got along with Francois so well that he wrote 100 letters that you can collect in the game in old French. So it creates this network of people that you can rely on to be more authentic, to, to have something that, that talks to more people in the end. Now, Digital tools like the WTF are fine, but just like me, I'm sure you have 1,000 newsletters, 1,000 intranet websites that you can go to for lore and knowledge. So it wasn't enough. So we created something called the WTF book. Each game at Ubisoft has one of these. It's only 1% of what's in the digital database, but we must never forget, because we designed digital things, that the physical space is key. Not only is it key because we must go places, but we, we, we create these books with original New York Times info, stickers, a bunch of info on the city. Uh, the division is developed out of uh, Sweden, and they didn't quite understand what Christmas meant in the Northeast, in the States. They wouldn't believe me when I told them there were FM stations dedicated to Christmas songs. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we need to have a, a radio station with Christmas songs only. And they're like, no, that can't be. So. We decided to send them to, uh, to the States in December so that they, they got the, the Christmas experience. Um, I'll show you another video quickly. Uh, what's important about the book is the team can rip it up. It's almost too pretty. That's a design flaw. It's too collectible. Now we try to make them a little more ugly so people rip them, put them on the walls, discuss the subject. 
uh, and, and talk together around something physical. I'll show you a quick video of excerpts from the book because I realize you saw absolutely nothing. Video number five, please. So um, that last visual is we build our own maps for our own data. Those are prisons and police stations related to gangs. Uh, it doesn't mean we're going to get this literally in the game. I want our creators to think of the systems and how to manipulate them and how they could impact. Uh, one of the key people we met with in New York was a FEMA engineer. We obsess on how to make great games and engaging games. He obsesses on uh, running simulations of what if catastrophes in New York. And one of the things that I'm convinced about in this process is that reality often surpasses fiction. So we're walking the streets of New York with them, and the pitch of the division is a quarantine New York. So you would lose power after a few days. And the female engineer is walking the streets with us, and he looks at us, and he's like, oh, so if we needed to bring power back in to New York, we'd bring in a battleship. That's what we did. That's what they did in the Southeast Asia after the tsunami. And they would literally pull a cables into the, into the grid. Now, first of all, I love the imagery because it's Akira. It's a city under perfusion. Second, a battleship is nuclear. It purifies water. It can hold 3,000 people. So now for my iconic image, I have battleships around the Manhattan Peninsula. Second thing they would do is bring in love boats. Love boats can also purify water, and they can hold 3,000 people. So I have something even more interesting. I have civilian and military uh, quarantine around the peninsula. Third thing he tells me is, oh, by the way, you're from Paris. I'm from New York. We all have friends over. We have no space. We New Yorkers are lazier than you Paris people, so we all have inflatable mattresses, which is a real issue for FEMA because that becomes a raft when you're trying to quarantine New York. He's like, so we have a scenario set up where we set up where we'll have gunboats patrolling the Hudson Bay. So I'm like, I would not have written that story. <laughs> okay? And this is, this is a guy who runs simulations cost every day. So it's just to say it's truly inspiring. And I'm from New Jersey. I thought I knew New York. I found out that there was a secret tunnel for Franklin D. Roosevelt from Grand Central Station to the Waldorf Astoria because handicap and his PR department didn't want pictures taken of him. I found out that one of the lines is a smaller tunnel because the Steinway family, the pianos, were actually, they dig the tunnel instead of going over, and that's why it's smaller. So all these stories, when we, we have worlds, for me, worlds are like layers of onions, and the narrative, or each, each peel, is an opportunity to tell these stories and help our players engage and know more about the world we live in. But that's not enough. We always need more. I, I, it's not a magic recipe to creating great worlds. We, we created dozens of tools like this at UB. We must create many more. Uh, one of the things we did around Far Cry 4 is I realized that we have an 18 square kilometer world and a lot of a I'm over vulgarizing, but let's just say that we have 18 teams set up in one kilometer uh, areas. Now, because everyone works behind their screen, it's difficult to get everyone around their world. So we printed out the world of Karat. Uh, the free original idea was whiteboard, and we're like, oh, we'll draw on it. It's actually impossible to erase a height map uh, on a whiteboard. So instead of wasting the money, we're like, all right, that's OK. We produce this. We will project our own world onto the whiteboard, and we will code an iPad with something close to Photoshop that allows us to play with drawing on the world, seeing the layers of logic. Uh, again, video please, number six, thank you.
Um, so this was interesting because first of all, I got people around a table talking as a team. They sell their, their, their virtual world in physical form. Uh, it's also a mise-en-scene tool. Uh, we actually coded something with a tracker where you get point of view in, in real time in the world. So for example, if you had a mission objective on top of that mountain to see how that would go. Uh, it was cool because as you may have understood in the, in the video, we have night and day cycles, seasons. It might seem trivial, but in the game where part of the game is, is, is catching or, or beating outposts, if you, pay, if you place an outpost on top of a mountain and during the Christmas season it's covered in snow, it makes, I mean, it makes no sense. Maybe it should be by a mine. Maybe it should be protecting something. Maybe it's, it's helping something travel. What is it protecting? All this, there are a million details like this that create consistency. And that's key to generating worlds that are engaging to the player. So, you know, we want to create more of these tools. I, if I had another two hours, I could showcase dozens of other ones where uh, this is super important to us. It's important to us because I'll rip Jack London off. I know it's boring, it's, uh, but, I, but I think it's true. You can't wait for inspiration. We're trying to go after it with a club. I challenge my teams every day to break their habits. Get out from, go in the real world. You think it's the ultimate job, but I sometimes get resistance. Oh no, we already know what special ops is. Oh no, we already know what New York is. I'm like, no, you don't. And so it takes a lot of effort, actually, to, for, for, for a company the size of UB, or even a small company, to change habits. I mean, I, I smoke, it's like, it's not that easy to quit smoking, <laughs> right? Every time I, I, I get stressed, every time I have a game to produce, any excuse is good to go back to it. So it's something that you have to work at every day. So first of all, we're, uh, we're curious to meet creatives that can help us uh, in that field. Uh, I'm Tommy, if you ever want to contact me, just have a creative talk, have your look on the world. I'm curious about this, uh, and, uh, and, and, and help Ubisoft do that.